Good afternoon, Facebook Live. This is Robin Kirby Gatto. Welcome to today. It's going to be an awesome day in the Lord. Amen. It, it is always an awesome day in the Lord. Amen. And so as you join on, saints of God, be hopeful and expectant. Holy Spirit is going to strengthen you. He's going to encourage you. He is just going to bring you hope. The Father's thoughts, Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, where his thoughts towards you are for a hope and a future. Amen. So as you join on, saints of God, you be hopeful and expectant. And oh my goodness, while I'm thinking about it, because I see you, Katie Higgum, I love you. And while I'm thinking about it, I am going to be doing group coaching this week. I will send it out to you. I will have it by Wednesday. So y'all be looking for Wednesday for those who register for group coaching. Amen. And we will have an awesome time. I don't know about those who have not been on group coaching. I see Lisa on here. She's in group coaching. But oh my goodness, Holy Spirit just brings such strength to those group coaching calls. Amen. Hey, Amber Tucker, love you. Thank you for joining in. So awesome to see you. Let me put my glasses on so I can see who all's joining in. Yeah. Hey, Stephanie, so awesome to have you on here. God bless you. Hey, Barbara Voigt. Hey, Judy Oswald. It's been a long time, sister. God bless you. Awesome to have you on today. And so as we get started, let us enter into the word of truth and prayer. Amen. Amen, Katie. Hey, Jenny Gailey, love you. Thank you for joining in. God, we just thank you for your strength. And that name of your holy name is a strong tower for us to run into, Father. And I thank you, God, that you are just going to bring such an understanding, a knowledge, a wisdom to our hearts and our mind in order that we will know holy, hallelujah, and that we are holy as you are holy, and that we will walk in the grace which you have distributed to us through Christ Jesus, your son, the way. In Jesus' name, amen. And as we get into today's teaching, <clears throat> it is going to be so, so awesome about Holy Spirit and what he is going to bring to strengthen you. Amen. <clears throat> and let me just re-emphasize the need in this hour. Two things. And I actually talked about this with Matthew. And Matthew's so funny because he's actually now listening to some of the same scientists, physicists, and neuroscientists that I've been reading about for about a year. And he was like, hey, mom, I heard da-da-da-da-da today. And I'm like, yes, Matthew. He goes, I know you've been telling me for about a year. I said, yes, Matthew. Now do you get it? And I told him what Holy Spirit has told me about in this hour that is just going to strengthen those in the circumstances that you might be enduring in battles, in warfare, in good times, in bad times. Two things. One, God is good. Amen. Two, He is working all things to our good. God is good. And Romans 8, 28, He is working all things to our good because why? We love Him and we are called according to what? His purpose. And we're going to look at that specifically today. And I'm going to be pulling just a snippet from Rev 22 2. And also, we're going to be looking at a little bit of my new book, Mindfulness, the Mind of Christ, which is 1 Corinthians 2.16. And we're going to get an understanding about a higher way of thinking, amen, which is holy. And so let's first start with 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, and we're going to be looking at verse 16, verse 16, and we're going to go across, across many scriptures we're going to look at Jeremiah 29, 11. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians 2, 16. We're going to look at Isaiah 35. Because understand in 1 Corinthians 2, we see scripture says that no one knows a man's mind except for his spirit. And Holy Spirit knows the mind of God. Holy Spirit shows us things that are fenced in and hidden. And those are the secret things as revealed in Proverbs 25. Psalm 25. Psalm 25 where God shows his secrets, verse 14, to his friends. In fact, before we actually get to 
1 Peter 1. Let us get to Psalm 25. And I actually bring this scripture in in Rev 22, where God reveals his secrets to his friend. And so the two emphasis you're really going to get mainly from Rev 22, 2, which is about God's watchmen. And don't think that you're not a watchman. Jesus talks about the end days watchmen in Matthew 24, verses 40 through 47, as he depicts two different distinctive groups. Those that are looking for his return, they're watching. That's what he says. They're watching. Well, that's watchmen. Those that are looking for his return, and they're giving out the supply of food, the supply that is needed in resources, and understand that is not only in the natural, but that is also in the supernatural, right? We see this revealed in Romans 1 20, where the God of the invisible makes himself known through the visible. And we see Jesus talking about a watchman group that will be giving out the supply that is needed in the end of days. What that can that supply be construed with? It can be construed with Psalm 92 10. That wild ox, that new anointing, that fresh anointing, which is likened unto Micah 4.13 of that wild ox that is being sifted, that is on the threshing floor and is lifted up. How is this wild ox lifted up? In the strength of the new anointing, the fresh anointing. We see Jesus depicting this with Peter when he says in Luke 22, Simon, Satan has asked excessively to sift all of you, but I've already prayed for you that when you return, you will what? Strengthen the brethren. And that's that new anointing. That is that fresh anointing. And so we're going to see scripture revealing such a grace that is given to us to be renewed in our strength. We see this also in Isaiah 40, 31. Those that wait on the Lord, he shall renew their strength. They will mount up as eagles going close to the sun. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. And so we're looking at that new anointing. What is the new anointing? It is the strength of Holy Spirit. It is the strength of who? Holy <laughs> What is the emphasis added to Holy Spirit? It is, Holy Spirit is holy, right? Holy Spirit is holy. And so that is a means by which, and I've already talked about it in the last group coaching session that I did, where I've already written about four chapters on the language of fruit, and I'm continuing and one of the emphasis that we see in the construct of the language of fruit is that as it relates to good fruit, righteous fruits in John 15, 8, that when we bear righteous fruits, it glorifies who? The Father. Amen. And we bear righteous fruits. Why? Because of John 15, 2, because we have been pruned in order to what? But bear more excellent fruit. And so every good fruit is on the construct, the paradigm, and what I bring in as the plumb line to all godly emotions, which is holy. So every good fruit stems from, branches out like a tree, from holy. And we'll see in Peter, 1 Peter 1.16, that we are to be holy as God is holy. Well, now pulling from Rev 22.2, the last book, God had me emphasize two themes, sonship and friendship. Sonship is where we get our authority that we are sons, we are daughters of the Most High. Jesus is the firstborn of what? Many brethren. And that brings authority. But illumination, or can we say, ding, 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 a higher way. Woo! A holy way, Isaiah 35, 8, which is a higher way of thinking. It is a holy way of thinking. Jesus is the way. And we always just look at him as when we hear that word way, as 
the door, but we don't see his model that he left you and I to be a footprint. Hallelujah. Where we walk in the string. And you know what is so amazing is I walk many times, Monday through Friday, I walk about 10 miles at least a day. And I try to get my walking in, and I'm really trying to get it in since I won't be able to walk for a week and a half after the surgery. And so, I've got new balance shoes because my chiropractor said, Robin, you've got to get new balance shoes. And I'm telling you, when I got this free foam, free foam wedge new balance shoes, I felt like I was walking on clouds. Oh, my goodness. And it was phenomenal, phenomenal. Well, I've only had those shoes just a few months. And they're really nice shoes. But I noticed on the bottom of that sole, of that of the underside of the shoe, that it was the waffle cone on the bottom was worn. And I just heard God quicken me in my inner man. And he said, Robin, do you notice that the more that you walk, the more your shoes are worn? And I said, yes, God. And even though we are not worn out, amen, we are not worn out. We're strengthened by Holy Spirit. And just like God did not let Israel's soul's shoes get worn out, right? But one of the things he emphasized with me, he said, You know what? The sole of your shoe demonstrates your walk. And I said, Okay, God, tell me more. And he said, You can tell a saint that has a relationship and intimacy with God because the bottom of their shoes is the evidence of that. And I was like, oh my goodness. And God said, anybody can look at the bottom of your shoes and they will know that you have walked a lot. Amen. And it just encouraged me and it strengthened me. And he said, you know, a saint whose shoes are worn, that saint is not worn out. And I was like, "Woo! glory to God. And that's that new anointing. That's that fresh anointing. And that is the result of the fruit of your friendship with God. And that is one of the other emphasis in Rev 22 too, that God has me talk about. And he brings in this Psalm 25, 14, where that revelation, the secrets that we have with the Father as Holy Spirit shows us things that are fenced in and hidden, that those secrets are because of our friendship. Just like Jesus in John 15, 15 said, No longer do I call you servant, but I call you friend. For I have given you everything that the Father has given me. And that is our friendship with God. So let me read Psalm 25, 14. Then we're going to go to 1 Peter 1, 16. And we're going to look at this emphasis of holiness because in this hour, in this hour, you have got to be focused and you have got to have your mind set, your face set like flint, like Jesus' eyes were still towards Jerusalem. And you have got to know the word. It has got to be so deep and rich in you which is the result of your friendship with God, your walk with God. Amen. And we'll get into what that means even more in just a little bit. So Psalm 25, 14 says, The secret woo, of the sweet, hallelujah, glory to God, I feel like I'm at a table. And I am at a table, amen. The secret of the sweet, woo, the fruit Taste and know that God is good. The Shulamite said, I ate of his fruit and I tasted it and it was sweet to my tasting. See, this friendship, this knowing of revelation by the spirit of knowledge, wisdom and understanding, Ephesians 1, 17 and 18, is the result of your friendship with God. Amen. The secret of the sweet and satisfying companionship of the Lord have they who fear, woo, revere and worship him, and he will show them his covenant, woo, and reveal it to them, its deeper inner meaning. See, this is a satisfaction 
that goes beyond that which is natural. It is supernatural. It is spirit. And when we look at the spirit, it is that which is invisible that you cannot see. And physicists really get into this area, especially in paranormal physics. As I mentioned in my book, Clawing and Gnawing, the fiction book, where paranormal physicists from the 1880s actually started studying antimatter. There's antimatter, that is what is invisible to the eye, and there is matter, that is what is visible, right? Well, in the earth, there is matter and there is antimatter. There is visible, there is invisible. And there is a natural distribution of the visible and the invisible within our person but also we see, as I brought into the book with CERN, and I talk about them being Prina in the book, they are creating antimatter that was never here before. And when that antimatter comes into the earth because they created it, they brought it in, one drop of that is the amount of four Hiroshima bombs. It is highly uncontrollable very explosive and we can liken that to the tongue of satan to the enemy's lies and that is why it's so important to have friendship with god because it's a love it's a reflection that you have received his love for you that you know who you are in that love and that you give that love to others and that is 2 Corinthians 3.18. You do not understand this. Like, we are standing in front of the reflection of ourself all day long. All day long. In all that we do. And we do not even realize it. But we are reflecting who we are inside of our person. We're reflecting that in our environment. And what we believe to be real. And when you have the holy way, woo, hallelujah, the highway of holiness, Isaiah 35, 8, which is a higher way of thinking. I get into it in my new book, Mindfulness, the Mind of Christ. And getting to that higher way of thinking, like an eagle being lifted up to the sun, then you have, hallelujah, clean thoughts. And you're seeing the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and you're seizing the fruit, and it satisfies your soul. It satisfies your spirit. You're renewed. You're strengthened. It's the difference between having not eaten in months and eating the meal of your life, which is both nutritious and delicious. And that is the highway of holiness. And when you're not on that highway, you are on the diet of this world. And its whole purpose, the diet of this world, is to destroy you. Destroy your organs. Destroy your cells, which lead to poor health, which leads to dis-ease. And so we're looking at the distinction of spiritual health and wellness compared to spiritual dis-ease. And that's the result of being in friendship with God. Now, let's look at a Hebrew word and let's get understanding. If you feel, God's telling me some people are on here and they feel like you can just, you cannot hear God. Understand there are those seasons. And even in Isaiah 35, which we'll look at before we get to verse 8, the whole chapter of Isaiah 35 distinguishes those that have been in that wilderness. And what is that wilderness? That is where you're allowed to go through by God's grace as Peter, where the enemy sifts you. And how's he going to be doing it? He's going to be sending messages to your mind that he knows have been conducive in tormenting or attacking you. Now, make a distinction it is not likened to unforgiveness where the tormentor has a right. The enemy has a right. Torment has a right. Tormenting spirits have a right 
if you're in unforgiveness. And in fact, scripture is clear. We cannot enter the afterlife eternity, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, if we have unforgiveness in our heart. And I get into detail about this in my book, At His Feet, when back in the mid-2000s, I was doing deliverance on a young lady that was probably about 18 or 19 at the time, or maybe 20, 21. And I was by myself. The other woman could not make it with me, the mentor that was supposed to come into that meeting. And it was a God thing. God knew. And that young lady walked out of the room when I told her she first had to forgive before we would do any deliverance. Because Forgiveness is the linchpin to your friendship with God, is the linchpin to your salvation. When you accept Jesus Christ, you have to walk in forgiveness and forgive others. And so she walked out of the deliverance meeting. She couldn't open her mouth. And I sat there and I just prayed in tongues while she was gone as Holy Spirit directed me. And probably about 10 minutes or so later, the young lady came back in and she sat down. She said, I wanted to leave. And then all of a sudden, she started opening up about when she was 13 years old. She had literally died. And while she was dead, she went to hell. And Jesus saw her there. And she said, Jesus told her the reason she was in hell was because of unforgiveness towards her father. And so she was resurrected and brought back and from that time of 13 years old, for that whole seven years, she still had not forgiven her father. And then Holy Spirit had me pray with her and bind the enemy, and she forgave him. And it broke like that. That is for whosoever is out there that is in unforgiveness. Forgiveness is your linchpin. Now, this attack of the enemy that I'm describing today is not like that tormenting spirits that are open that you're open to if you have unforgiveness this is not that but it is that sifting that is in Luke 22 that Jesus describes about Peter going through as we see with Job the prophet and so Job was sifted and he was the most righteous man at the time understand Peter was sifted and he was going to be the one whom Jesus passed the torch in the tower of the flock. And I'm going to get into that at Passover. And especially when I do the Seder in Missouri. I'll be going to Missouri at the time of close to Passover. But Peter was being left to be in charge of the flock. And Jesus was preparing Peter that once he was sifted, it was for one purpose, and it was to strengthen the brethren. Why would he strengthen the brethren? Because he would have a new anointing. Why? Because Peter would be pruned of what? Pride! And that pruning would prune that which is unholy, John 15, 2, in order that Peter could bear what? More excellent fruit. Which would do what? John 15, 8. Glorify the Father. Hallelujah. You shall know a tree. Matthew 12, 33. By its fruit. And Jesus definitely distinguished how we will know each other's fruit. And he said, it's, what not, does it, it's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him. It is what comes out of his mouth that defiles him. And Jesus delineates our fruit will be known by our words. It is not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him, but what comes out. Matthew 15, 11. I like to get you scriptures. So let's look at the Hebrew word here as we look at the Hebrew word secret. And so I say all of this getting to the point that the wilderness represents, which is midbar in Hebrew, wilderness, and it comes from the Hebrew root word debar, which means to speak. It means a word. And so as in Matthew 4, where Jesus went into the wilderness under the power of Holy Spirit, when Holy Spirit came down like a dove, and Jesus had that power, and that's prophesied in Isaiah 11 too, 
of the sevenfold dimension of Holy Spirit that's operative upon Messiah, upon Jesus. And so he goes into the wilderness in that power and he comes out in power. Amen. And so when we look at the wilderness, you might feel like you're in a dry season, like you're not hearing God, but that is the time of testing. You might feel like you're not able to pray, that you're just not feeling any oomph. And I would highly exhort you to pray scriptures. Pray First Chronicles 29, 11 through 13. Pray Ephesians 1, 17 through 23. Pray Ephesians 3, 16 through 21. Pray Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. Pray John 1, 1 through 5. I mean, there's a gazillion prayers through scripture that you can pray. And that is going to be the meal that satisfies you in that wilderness as Jesus went through and he fasted and angels then ministered to Jesus. That is very indicative of of how God is for us in the new anointing, the fresh anointing, that all of a sudden his word becomes fruit. And we're like, where did this come from? Now, glory to God, I feel a strength I haven't had before. And that is because the veil has been removed from your face and you've held on to that word and not denied his name as in Revelation 3, 8, like the church of Philadelphia, and you've had but a little strength, and that's when the new anointing comes on you. That's that wild ox. The wild ox in Micah 4, 13, and I get into that in my book, Rev 22, 2, the wild ox is on the threshing floor, laying down, is just destitute. And God lifts the wild ox up on the threshing floor. Amen. And so let's look at this Hebrew word here for secret. This is what we're going to look at. And then God's going to have us go on to 1 Peter 1. And we're going to get into that. Amen. Praise God. I'm so excited that y'all showed up today. You just do not know. I always get excited <clears throat> when God has you show up here because you could be anywhere right now i totally respect that and you need to be where god wants you and i totally appreciate you signing on today so this hebrew word for secret in hebrew is sowed and i love this because i think about mark 4 and the core parable that i went over last week about the sower of seed the seed is what the word and the soil is what the soul the self image right so what's being transformed from glory to glory is our image. That's 2 Corinthians 3, 18. As we behold the glory of God, which means his thoughts, his opinions, as we behold his opinions, his thoughts, as in a mirror. So what does that mean? Every day you have opportunity to see the reflection of your image in your circumstances in other people. That no matter what, one, God is good. And two, God is working all things to your good because you love him and are called according to his purpose. Amen. So this Hebrew word is sowed and it means intimacy. It means consultation, a secret assembly. It means counsel, inward secret. It means deliberation in close deliberation. It's not that you're far apart on a telephone and you're calling somebody or on Facebook, it's that you are close, face to face, amen, and you are in that secret counsel, that close deliberation. And so this comes from the Hebrew word yasad, yasad, and it means to settle, to consult, it means sure. Now let's look at the Hebrew letters because it's semech. It's Vav and Dalet. Samech, Vav and Dalet. And Lisa, God says a door is about to open for you, sister, of ministry. He says a bigger door. So, Samech, Vav and Dalet. S-A-M-E-C-H, Samech. It has that ch sound. Samech. <clears throat> and it looks like the old 1970s TV cables, the ancient symbol. 
that has two lines on top of that antenna that's on top of your house. And it means to support and it means to turn and means to prop. Then we have VAV, V-A-V, it's a tent peg, a nail, it means to add and secure. And then we have DALET, it's a door, D-A-L-E-T, and it means enter and pathway. And so the word picture for secret is to be supported for God to turn you around and add and secure to you the path. Woo! To enter it the way. Oh my goodness! Do you not feel the anointing on that? Is that amazing? So let's do that word picture again. To be supported and propped up as God turns you around and adds and secures to you for you to enter the path, the way. That is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways. Acknowledge God, and He shall what? Direct your path. He'll, he'll direct your way. Amen. And so let's look particularly where Jesus says, I am the way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. John 14, 6. And isn't it interesting that this is also before John 15, where we're looking at fruit. Jesus is saying, I am the way. And then he's talking about our fruit in the very next chapter. John 14, and I want to read the verse right before 6 and after 6. So John 14, 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, had learned, woo, I know what's coming up because I know the scripture, to recognize me, you would also know my Father. From now on, you have known him. You see, you have seen him. And Philip said to him, show us, Lord, show us the Father. Cause us to see. That is all we ask. And then we shall be satisfied. We shall be filled. But watch what Jesus says. Are you ready? And Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this long a time, and you do not know or recognize me yet, Philip? Anyone who has seen me, he says, has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And here it is, verse 10. Are you ready? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? What I am telling you, I do not say in my own authority and of my own accord, but the Father who lives continually woo, in me does His works. Hallelujah. His own miracles, His deeds, His power. And I love this scripture. And of course, we get into the greater work shortly after that. But when we look at this scripture and we see Philip's confused, we see Thomas is confused. What, what's the way to the Father? And how, how, do, how can we see the Father? We see John 1, 18 about Jesus that no man has seen God at any time except for Jesus, the Son of God, who was in the bosom of the Father and he has come to interpret God, to make him known. <clears throat> Jesus came to show us the Father. He came to show us the way. Amen. That's reconciliation. That's Colossians 1. Amen. The ministry of reconciliation. Where we are reconciled to who? The Father. Jesus is the way. Amen. And so when we look at this, saints of God... The enemy comes in and he tries to attack our mind. There are areas in which we are totally unconscious of it. That is in our subconscious where memories are there that are experiences within our life that are 
negative. They're of the enemy. They're not good fruit. And so Jesus prunes that fruit. The word by the power of Holy Spirit cuts that bad fruit, unclean fruit, unclean ways off of a person in order that we bear what? More excellent fruit. So as Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And if you don't believe that, Philip, look at my fruit. Look at my works. Because the fruit I have is not just my fruit. It's the Father's fruit. <laughs> Woo! Matthew 11, 12, and 13. That the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violence. The violent suffers violence, and the violent, be ostis, seize it by force. And the intimacy, the higher way of thinking, the holiness, the holy way is for you to see and taste, to know that God is good, and to taste of His fruit. And when you taste and eat of that fruit, by virtue, hallelujah, which is demonstrated in your character, and it is demonstrated in power. Listen, when Holy Spirit has me pray for different people, while I'm there praying, and if I'm laying hands on them, I can literally feel that virtue come out of my person of Holy Spirit and bring freedom, bring healing, saints of God. It is real. We are to be sisters, brothers in Christ Jesus that are the firstborn of many brethren. Amen. We are to have the fruits of Holy Spirit. Fruits of righteousness. John 15, 8, which glorify the Father. Amen. So let's look at, let's look at now 1 Peter 1, 6, 1, 16. Amen about being holy because understand that all the fruits of the father that reveal his goodness that reveal who he is all of those fruits are on the construct the paradigm the plumb line as in zechariah 4 where the prophet zechariah is encouraging zerubbabel to get back to building the temple zerubbabel is worn out the people have been oppressed distressed in warfare and holy spirit through the prophet is strengthening zerubbabel and rejoicing rejoicing when zerubbabel just holds the plumb line and so the plumb line of all the good fruit of god of the kingdom of heaven is holy now a lot of people might be saying robin that word holy is an enigma. It makes no sense. I don't understand it. Holiness, Kadesh in Hebrew, is being consecrated, separated. What does that mean? It also means to be clear and to be pure. And so it's having pure thoughts, good thoughts, thoughts of holiness of the word that is in you, where no matter what, not that you can't use discernment, but you're believing the best about others, that you have clean hands and a pure heart, and your intention is to think the best, to pray for your enemies, to bless those who curse you. It is all of the substance of God that you have to seize His fruit because you don't have the resource within yourself. Our fallen nature wants pride to come up. It wants to defend. It wants to preserve. But God is our strong tower. He is our defense. And as long as we are under the banner of His love, Song of Solomon 2, 4, Isaiah 4, 5, and 6, as long as we are under the banner of His love, he is our defense, and we continue to bear abundant fruit. Amen. 
And so let's look at scripture in 1 Peter 1, and we're going to understand the word holy in a greater measure, and we're going to get an understanding of it because as I depict, as God leads me to depict in the book that I'm doing, it's about the mind and the body connection in the first place that's consecrated as we see God expressing it through the Apostle Paul. In Romans 12, 1, he says, look, consecrate your body. Make a decisive decision. Consecrate your body as holy as unto God which is your reasonable worship. And then after the body's consecrated, then he goes to the mind. And be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind to prove what is the acceptable will of the Father. In other words, to know his way. And understand that mind does not just mean your brain. It means your whole person in the area of your will your soul has its own mind and our spirit has its own mind as we come into salvation and we we are born from above john 1 john 3 and we are children of god we are given that new spirit and so that new spirit that has second timothy 1 7 power love and a sound mind has the will of the Father. That new spirit doesn't have our soul's will. That new spirit we are given has the will of the Father. That's all that that new spirit has is the will of the Father. And so Holy Spirit teaches us the secrets of God to our spirit man. And our spirit agrees with those secrets. And Holy Spirit and our spirit make it known to our soul where our soul that has the ungodly way, the ungodly will is being pruned of that which is not of God. And then the will of the Father is being added to the soul. Ephesians 1.12, work out your own salvation. Philippians 1.12, Work out your own salvation in fear and in trembling. And so that salvation is being worked out in our soul. Work out your own salvation. I always like to double check. Yes, Philippians 2.12. So your soul equals your self-image. And so who you believe you are, what you believe about yourself, is what you're also going to believe about others. Amen. And so let's look at 1 Peter 1, and we're going to look at 1 Peter 1, 16, and then we're also going to go to John 14, and we're going to look at the word way, and also we're going to go into Isaiah 35 before we close, amen? So 1 Peter 1, 16, scripture, well, let's start in verse 14, live as children of, a, well, let's start in verse 13. So brace up your minds, your will, what you're going to choose. Be sober, circumspect, morally alert, set your hope wholly, unchangeably on the grace, not legalism, not works of your old nature, of your soul, but the works of Jesus Christ, amen, the fruit, faith, amen. So that you uh, unchangeably on the grace that is coming to you when Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is revealed. When grace is revealed. That's the fruit of Jesus Christ. Grace. Amen. Grace, the new covenant. Live as children of obedience. Do not conform yourselves to the evil desires that governed you in your former ignorance when you did not know the requirements of the gospel. But be as the one who called you is holy. Be holy. You yourselves be holy. And what? All conduct. Help us, Jesus. And manner of living. Oh, let us camp out here. Oh, my goodness. Don't you feel the grace on that? Listen to verse 15 again. But as the one who called you is holy. Yourselves also be holy 
in all your conduct and manner of living. For it is written, you shall be holy. For I am holy. And if you call upon him as your father, who judges each one impartially according to what he does, then you should conduct yourselves with true reverence throughout the time of your temporary residence on earth, whether it is long or short. So we're going to look at a couple of words here, especially in 1 Peter 1, 16. And we're going to see as it relates to being holy in our conduct. Now understand that holy in our conduct means our mind and our body. What does that mean? We are mastering our emotions. When we see bad fruit, and I did a whole session, session 11 of the group coaching, which is going to be in the book of the acronym of fruit for conceptual elements at any time to stop and pause and examine your fruit. And it gets you into the conscious mind where you get out of the subconscious where the enemy's equipment is operating against your soul, your self-image, and it gets you to see the kingdom of heaven and to seize the fruit and to take thoughts captive, amen? And so let's look at particularly about holy. So as we look at the word holy, and I did this last year, I went into Isaiah 6 and how the seraphim are crying out to God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is full of his glory. And so the seraphim see what? The fruit. The fruit. They're not seeing the fruits of the world. Their eyes are only focused on the fruit of God. Why? Because the seraphim are in his holy presence. They're holy. Because they have not eaten of the bad fruit. Man has eaten of the bad fruit, right? And so whose eyes are open to bad fruit? The prophet. What does the prophet say? Oh, woe is me. I'm a man of what? Unclean. Unclean what? Lips. Why? Be and he says, and I'm among a people of what? Unclean what? Lips. Remember what Jesus said? It's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him. It's what comes out of a man's mouth that defiles him, and what does that represent? Your fruit. See, Isaiah the prophet probably considered himself the most righteous man at the time, but God had to allow him to be sifted. Why? Because he was going to prophesy to the remnant, and had the prophet's heart, mind, not been dealt with, then he would have cursed the remnant because of pride. How do we know this? Same thing with Paul the Apostle on the road to Damascus. And a lot of people look at that road to Damascus experience in the book of Acts with Paul. Let me get, I love getting scripture. I want to get scripture to you. I love having scripture. Amen. Because I do not want you not having scripture. Acts 9, Acts 9. And so, a lot of people look at that and they're like, man, Jesus just shook him. And they do not see what's actually occurring and what's really going on. Because the resurrection power of God is two sides of a coin. The two sides, as it looks like I have two sides to this Bible, one side is the love of God. And the other side is the fear of the Lord. And if we are not, hey Sherry, I love you. If we're not in the love of God, then we have imbalance. We have the beam in our eye and we walk in pride. And I know this because I've been in that ditch. So we have to have the love of God and that is the higher way. It is both the reverential and worshipful fear of God and the love of God. That is resurrection power. And so when we look at Isaiah 
And when we look at Paul, and God showed me this in 2015 when I did the Malachi 3, 1 through 4 conference, and I taught that scripture, which I absolutely love, and God had me bring in Isaiah 6 and had me refer to Acts 9. God said, Robin, let me show you what I revealed to Paul and to Isaiah. And I said, okay, God, glory to God. He said, in those moments... I revealed my unfailing love. And I went, what? You revealed your unfailing love? He said, yes. Isaiah the prophet did not have the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding of my unfailing love for my remnant, my people who were about to be carried off into oppression and so I had to show him my love. That when he saw the remnant, he would not curse them and say, you deserve this. This is what you brought on yourselves. No, he would see my heart Woo! for the remnant. And I went, oh my goodness. And he said, Robin, that is what I showed Paul through my son. And I went, what? What? He said, yes. The love of Christ melted his heart and turned him toward me. And I went, oh my goodness. And God said, Robin, that is the core, the crux of who I am is love. And pride, saints of God, pride keeps us from the true knowledge of love. And what does what happens when we're not in the knowledge of God's love? First, John 4, 18, we have fear and thoughts of dread of what? That we're supposed to be punished. Why? Because we're bad. We're bad. No, God loves us. He has an unfailing love. Woo! He's merciful. He's good. Hallelujah. And it doesn't mean he doesn't correct us. Yes, he does. Because we're his sons and his daughters. And he chastises those whom he loves. Amen. And so Holy Spirit showed me through Isaiah 6 with a seraphim crying out holy. And I said all that to get to this point. Is that holiness is both the clarity of thoughts of the will of the Father, and that separates you unto His will, but also you can emotionally feel holy. What does it feel like? You feel clean. You feel pure. It's like you had, the only thing I can analogize it to, this refreshing, not a hot bath. If anything, I would compare it to getting into a hot tub and then getting out and putting on cold water or whatever. But it's a refreshing bath. It's a fresh anointing. A new anointing. Amen. And you feel what? Lifted up. That is Isaiah 40, 31. Amen. And so let's get to Isaiah. Well, we're not going to really get to it today. But we'll get to it next time. And I'll be back on Facebook next week. Because I have surgery Thursday. So I won't be on for the rest of the week. But I will do coaching. And I'll send coaching calls out to those who register. But this is where we end as we get ready to go into the next time, Isaiah 35. There is a, a walk with the Lord. Uh, Isaiah 35 is the representation of that. And we see also Psalm 4610 about be still and know that God, He is going to be there. He is going to refresh you like Psalm 46 says, where He is like those rivers within our person. It's that rivers of living water, Psalm 42, 7. And so in this hour, understand the greatest thing that we can apprehend in the midst of adversity, in the midst of trying and testing, in the midst of circumstances in this world is one thing. To know God is good. And number two, to know he is working all things to our good. Why? Because we would love him. We're reflecting that love. And we're called according to 
His purpose. Amen. So God bless you. I love you. Be strengthened. Hold on. God has not given up on you. Pray for one another. Strengthen and exhort one another while it is light and we can walk in the light. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I love you. I'll see you next time.